Hello and welcome to Filibustering History, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, lead faculty for history at Southern New Hampshire University's College of Online and Continuing Education. You may or may not have noticed, but we took a break for a couple of months. During that time, we took stock of this podcast series and the other history podcast series, got some feedback from various listeners, and generally wanted to see if this thing had legs. That feedback from students, instructors, administrators, and outsiders was positive. So here we are, back for more. I suppose we can call this season two of the podcast. Our budget is a bit bigger, the lighting in the studio is a lot better, the coffee is a bit stronger, and we may even have some very special guest stars appear from time to time. And yet the host rambles on and on just as much as always. I will continue to interview instructors at SNU, but we are going to expand our pool of interviewees a bit. I will talk to former students who graduated from SNU and have gone on to do interesting things, such as today's guest, who finished the MA program in history and is about to start a PhD program at the University of California. I will also try to bring in some people who are not affiliated with SNU, or who work in different fields that require some of the historian's skill sets. Or, if everything else falls through, I can always bust out the ukulele and lead you in some stirring campfire songs. I will try to post a new episode every two weeks. Each episode will be in the 20 to 30 minute range, just like the last batch of interviews. You know, it'll be just long enough to hit Starbucks on the way to work or keep you busy while your seven-year-old watches that weird Minecraft video on YouTube for the 12th time. That Maybe that last one is just my own life. Before I move on, I'd like to thank a few people who helped get this podcast started and who kept it alive during the break. Thanks to my bosses at SNU, including Associate Dean of Program Laurie Stein, Executive Director Ruth Lottie, and Vice President of Academic Affairs Cheryl Phillips. Thanks also go to the late, great Michael Bell, who first encouraged me to start this project about a year ago. The most thanks, I'm not quite sure how you measure thanks, but if there is a finite amount of thanks in the world, then the lion's share of that thanks goes to James Fennessy, the Associate Dean of Faculty for History, who has been the podcast's most vocal cheerleader since the beginning. He, possessing inhuman skills involving the successful navigation of academic bureaucracies, spread the word about this project back at Manchester HQ, handled all the various budgeting requests, reports, and requisitions, and suggested some of the historians whose voices you've heard already and will hear in the future. One of these days, you'll even hear his voice on the podcast, but today is not that day. Anyway, on with the show. Today I am talking to Stephen Green, a recent graduate of SNHU's online Master of Arts program in history, who will soon start a doctoral program in history at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Today we will talk about his historical research interests, the PhD application process, and the goals he hopes to reach through the PhD. What is your name and what do you do? My name is Stephen Green, uh, and in a few months, uh, September to be exact, I'm going to be a student um, in the History PhD program at University of California, Santa Cruz. That's awesome, and congratulations, and we're going to come back and talk about that process in just a minute here, but before we do, uh, what is your uh, academic and professional background in history? So my academic background, uh, I received my associate's degree, so my A degree from West Hills Community College in Lemoore, so it's a small town in the Central Valley of California. Um, I originally went there to play golf, so that was kind of my main focus. Um, Once I graduated from there, I uh, transferred to California State University East Bay up in Hayward, which is right across the bay from San Francisco, where I received my bachelor's degree. Um, After that, I took about six months off, and then I uh, enrolled in Southern New Hampshire's master's degree program, and I graduated there with my master's degree in October of 2016, so about six or seven months ago. What were your uh, historical research interests, either as an undergrad or in your grad program at SNHU? My broad research interests tend to focus more on immigration, social and ethnic history, usually during the Gilded and Progressive Eras, which are, you know, for for those of you who who don't know, um, is from about 1870 to 1920. Diving a little bit further, uh, my focus research interest uh, included Jewish immigration into the United States during that time period. Uh, specifically their use of ethnic and immigrant-based societies such as you know, fraternal orders, delayed societies, uh, benevolent societies, things like that. My ultimate goal in you know, doing this research is to build like an in-depth look at the social and economical approach to how Jewish immigrants you know, lived in these larger urban areas and how they coped with you know, coming to a new area and settling down. 
uh, for the rest of their lives and then for you know generations after after that so that was kind of my uh research interest um in my undergrad and especially now in my graduate studies and you're going to continue with that project in the phd program yeah um i'm gonna continue with that research uh, so my ma thesis was entitled uh, to lend a helping hand a comparative look at jewish and italian ethnic organizations in buffalo and new york city from 1870 to 1924 so that was the working title of my ma thesis and i did that and um, I, I don't know if I'm going to follow that exact um, route, but it's going to be something very similar to that, um, just probably a little more in-depth and definitely longer. Yeah, th- I think that's a, a good plan. It's, it's, I had intended when I got my master's degree, it was in uh, Reconstruction, or California during Reconstruction, and so I had fully intended to carry on with that when I got to the doctoral program. Uh, but then I ended up, after a couple terms, just completely <laughs> moving on to a different century and went out of the 20th century. And so it's uh, it's good to have uh, it's it's good to have the plan. Um, I in some ways wish I had stuck with it, but um, yeah, you never know what'll come up as you uh, go through your coursework in the in the in the uh, doctoral program. Of course, that's um, one of my first meetings with my uh, potential ad- advisor um, at UC Santa Cruz. You know, he was kind of telling me that this the same thing how. You come in with a bunch of different research interests, and you usually stick to them, but it, sometimes you go in totally different routes that you never even imagined. So, If you do end up going in other directions, do you have any other research interests that you've been thinking about, or has that kind of been consuming you? Um, that's been consuming me so far. Um, I might – I definitely want to stick with Jewish immigration. Um, that's kind of you know my, my calling card. That's what I know most about, and that, that's, that's what I feel like I you know would – do the best in, um, but I might, you know, pick different av- avenues within that. Um, but like I said, I'm mostly focused on, you know, their social and e- economic approach to, you know, surviving um, in, 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 in America during a, a time when it was pretty hard for people who weren't white native, you know, native speaking English. That's that's great. That I think I think there's a lot of potential there, and I, and I uh, wish you all the best with um, that research project. So uh, we will move on a little bit to the uh, the application and the PhD process and all of that. Um, so as you mentioned, you recently applied and were accepted to the graduate program at UCSC. Uh, so how and why did you arrive at the decision to pursue the PhD degree? And how did you decide which programs or universities to apply to? Originally, when I was getting my undergraduate degree, um, I did not plan on getting a PhD. Um, I kind of, you know, told myself that I was kind of un- unattainable. So I kind of just started looking into master's programs. I was originally going to teach high school. Um, and then once I saw, you know, how I could put together, um, especially after my MA thesis was done, that I could put together, you know, an original research project, um, you know, that was over 100 pages, I, I really believed that the PhD was the best choice for me. And then, you know, it became my driving goal to become a professional historian. Um, so that was kind of like the turning point. It was kind of late as far as, you know, deciding what I wanted to do with my academic background. But once I figured out that, that was, that was probably when I knew that I wanted to get a PhD. Yeah, and how did you decide uh, to apply at UCSC or which which schools did you apply to? I guess yeah. you don't need to explain exactly which uh, schools you applied to, but how yeah. did you decide which schools to apply to? So I actually went on um, the OHA website, which is the Organization for American Historians, mm-hmm. um, and also the a- AHA website, the American Historical Association. Um, they have great resources um, for figuring out what schools have PhD programs just in general in history. Um, and then for, from there, what I did was browse a lot of departments and seeing if they offer you know my exact program, if they have my research interests. Um, and then from there, I looked at professor pro profiles that were you know teaching at the university for potential advisors that shared my research interests and i came up with a list of about 14 to 15 schools that i figured would be the best fit for me um and then i went from there that's a good way to do it that is <laughs> that's that's how we always suggest people do it when they're looking for uh, phd programs that's not the way i went about it i did the uh kind of generic u.s news and world report what are the best you know the the top listings and all of that and i just kind of started sending out applications kind of scattershot and ended up getting um accepted to 
uh, three or four programs. Um, and then at that point, I actually started doing research to figure out which one, uh, one of those <laughs> would be the best for me. So it wasn't the most effective or efficient way to do it, but it, it all worked out. Yeah, so my original focus was to try and get into you know some of the bigger names, you know, like Cal, University of Chicago, Princeton, so, you know, some of the heavier, heavier hitting schools that were ranked within the, the top five or ten of the U.S. and the, the college week rankings. But in talking to a few of their professors, um, you know, they were taking six to seven students out of a pool of 600 or 700. You know, the applications were a couple hundred dollars. So, you know, I, I kind of had to tailor my expectations. You know, I wasn't trying to doubt, doubt myself in any way, um, but I was kind of more of a realist. So I was looking more at schools um, that really fit where I was. Um, and then, you know, talking to those professors, you know, where I would be a good fit. So, And that's the best way to do it. Um, having a degree at the end of it that says Harvard on it isn't going to do you much good if you don't have a good experience there or if you don't have a good working relationship with your advisor. And so it's definitely is best to find, even if it's a, and I don't want to slight UC Santa Cruz in any way. I mean, that's still a top-notch uh, University of California. I th- believe that one still classifies as a research one institution, so that's, there's nothing to sneeze at there. But still, I think it is best to focus on the program that works best for you and to try to find advisors and other professors that will work best for you also. So that's a, a smart way to do it. I'm, I'm glad to hear you went that route. When you think about it, especially in talking to my uh, you know, my advisor that's going to be my advisor, uh, Dr. David Brundage, um, you know, they have all of these connections with different, you know, professors at other research institutions, too. You know, it's not just UC Santa Cruz you're going to be working with. You know, you're going to be working with other professors from other schools. And, and it could be some of the, you know, the bigger top name research universities. But just like you said, um, UC Santa Cruz is a great research institu- institution, great set of teachers there. So I'm really excited to start there. Yeah. Yeah, that's and that's great. I think it's going to be a great um, a great experience for you. Um, I've been to the campus once or twice, and I've, I was impressed. So, how would you describe the application process? What what all did you have to do for that? Well, the application process um, it's definitely a little more time consuming than your standard un- undergrad application. Uh, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So, for each a- application, uh, you're usually looking at um, you know three to four letters of recommendation from professors you've taken classes with. Um, so for me, I had two from my undergrad and two from my MA program here at Southern New Hampshire that uh, agreed to write me letters of recommendation. Dr. McC- McConnell being, you know, one of the most significant I had her with in three classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really built a great relationship with her and was able to, you know, call on her to help me out. And, you know, she agreed and was very helpful throughout the whole process. In addition to those, you know, you have your GRE test scores, which most I want to say every school requires for grad entrance, um, so you have to take your GRE test, you know, prior to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you have your uh, two to three different short essay type questions uh, that you know that vary depending on each institution. So, you know, for instance, UC Santa Cruz only had two, and they were pretty vague and similar to a lot of them. But I know, like University of Maryland had, I think, six different essays that I had to answer. So it was kind of more 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 rigorous, and then uh, you know just the general application and sending in transcripts. Um, it's pretty much the same thing, just a little more in depth. You have to include a few more things that you wouldn't normally ordinarily include. Yeah, that's pretty much the same as it was for me when I uh, applied for grad school about um, twelve years ago, I guess it was. And uh, yeah, we had to do letters of recommendation, the GRE, writing sample. Um, I think for the writing sample, I ended up just sending in my MA thesis to most of the places I applied to. But some of them required something of specific lengths. Some of them required something that was completely original that hadn't been submitted to another university for another course or anything. Some specifically asked for something that had been submitted to a, a course at another university. So those requirements vary fairly widely, but... Generally, yeah. yeah, you've got the transcripts, writing sample, letters of recommendation, GRE scores. That's that's pretty common. Yeah, my writing sample, um, luckily I didn't have to do anything original. What most of the places wanted, I, I think almost everyone except one, wanted about a 25 to 30 page sample. So what I did was I took one chapter from my MA thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, I sent them a little bit of background on you know what the thesis was about, the title of it, um, just so they weren't kind of you know reading something from the middle of a book, essentially. Yeah. Uh, 
and and that worked. Um, I, I got a lot of good feedback from uh, you know from professors, especially from UC Santa Cruz. But yeah, that 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 was kind of the same thing, just like you went through. Now, did you hear at any time during the application process, or the or since you were uh, accepted, did you hear any hesitation or concerns from any of the people involved? about the fact that you got your MA from an online program instead of a traditional in-person campus? Surprisingly, no. Um, and I, I say that without having known you know, exactly why I was denied entrance to, you know, 10 to, to, to 14 different schools. Sure. Uh, that could have been one of the reasons, um, you know, I'm not 100% sure. But I feel like especially with a- able to put out my writing sample and the fact that I got, you know, straight straight A's through my whole tenure there at Southern New Hampshire, um, I feel like, you know, a lot of schools, at least I would hope they would, um, you know, not look at it as, you know, like a second-rate institution compared to others. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was one of my concerns, however, when I first started at Southern New Hampshire. But once I got into the classes and, you know, saw the assignments and saw, you know, that, that it was rigorous, it wasn't, you know, easy just because it was an online school. Uh, you know, it required a lot of work, and I put in a lot of a- effort into it. So, um, no, I did not get that vibe, but... Also, that could have been. You know, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, and and that sounds about right. I, uh, of course, everybody. I mean, there's been for a long time concern in academia about the effectiveness of online programs and how that's going to affect people that are trying to go on to, to higher level uh, programs and all of that. And I think your experience is becoming the norm. I think lately, in the last 10 years or so, since most traditional campuses are also now offering online degree programs. I mean, Southern New Hampshire's online degree program is an offshoot of its ground campus in New Hampshire, so same type of system. Uh, And I think it is becoming more uh, easily acceptable. Or um, I've talked to a number of instructors or professors at Research One schools and asked them about this as part of their application process. And more and more of them have been saying recently that the Online versus offline is not really as much of a concern anymore. The focus tends to be more like on the writing samples and the general quality of the students' work. They're not so much concerned about where the degrees came from. It's more about the quality of the student itself, which I think is a great development because 10, 15 years ago, most academics looked at online programs with suspicion. You know, this is second tier. This is stuff that people that can't make it in a regular environment, but that's obviously not the case. And I think more and more academics around the, around the world are starting to accept that, which I think is definitely a good thing, especially for our students. So I'm glad to hear that that has not been an issue for you. And like you said, who knows if it played an issue in those other schools where you didn't get accepted, but nobody gets accepted to everything anyway, and so who knows what could have played into those decisions. So that's good to know. And, and just like you said, you know, a, lo- a lot of schools are you know jumping into the on- online game. You know, it's not just Southern New Hampshire. You know, you have Arizona State who offers you know a competitive one. Right. I think TCU and Texas Tech both do. So you know, it's not just you know, one school for, you know, people who, you know, just like you said, can't make it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's for a lot of people who just don't have the time right now to um, to actually go to a brick and mortar place. Yes. You know, in degree, so. Yeah, and the percentage of the student population that is the traditional student that we tend to think of, you know, the 18 to 22 year old as undergrads, that just is not the norm anymore. And so I, th- I, th- I think the online system is a reflection of just the general reality of academia today. So at this point, um, I know you're just getting started here, but what are your goals for the degree? Are you looking for a specific career afterwards, or what, what are you planning to do with it, if anything, yet at this point? So my ult- ultimate goal is to be able to teach college. Um, you know, I originally said that you know my, my goal was to teach high school, and I, I you know I still want to be a teacher. I still want to have the same impact that I feel you know instructors had on me. I feel like you know that's really important to me is to be able to give back to students who you know are either you know struggling or they you know they're just going through and want a great experience with a teacher. So that's my ultimate goal is to you know, become a professional historian and teach at the college level. I do also know that uh, you know te- teaching at the college level is a bit impacted, um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of one of the concerns I had about you know even applying to a PhD. So with with that being said, uh, you know I am open to other, of of the jobs. You know I, I think you know working uh, in some sort of library setting, uh, working with archives or at a museum would also also be a really cool way to you know use my degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the cool thing with UC Santa Cruz is they they do what's called a PhD plus program, 
So they actually have courses geared on finding jobs and being able to, you know, apply your degree to several different areas. So that's pretty cool. That is good. That's actually excellent. I'm glad to hear that they're doing that. I think more more degree granting institutions, especially at the PhD level, well, at any level, I suppose, but for our purposes today, especially at the PhD level, I think it's great that universities are starting to get more concerned with that because, as you said, the job market for PhDs uh, to teach at, a, at the university or college level is difficult to put it mildly, yeah. and so <laughs> I think it's it's good. I mean, we've the the problem is that. Uh, institutions like the UCs and all across the country are still churning out PhD students at the same rate that they did over the last 30 or 40 years, but the number of actual full-time tenure-track jobs exactly. that are open have dwindled, you know, <laughs> disastrously. So it's good to hear that they have a program in place to try to help their graduates find something afterwards because it's it's we we need it. Yeah, and I'm sure you know, just like you've probably experienced them, a lot of the universities they they work really hard to to place you um, upon graduation. Um, I think last time I checked at UC Santa Cruz, they had a 78% placement in um, teaching positions, so it's pretty good. 70% is not nothing to shy away from. So uh, there is definitely a, a you know a good background there to help you uh, you know secure a job in the field of teaching so do you have any idea how how many uh grad students they admit each each year uh so there was 11 admitted in my class three of which already had a master's so i was one of the three that already had a master's so we get to skip about a year and and then a half of classes Mm -hmm. um and then the rest of them were straight from the bachelor's so they have to do a little bit of master's work and be able to put a thesis in before they start on their phd work um so they kind of have like a built-in MA PhD pro- program, and if you've already done your MA, you kind of get to skip a few. So. And did they give you any kind of general thinking about how long it's going to take to graduate if you come in with an MA versus without an MA? I'm going to save about a year. I, I believe the um, the BA to PhD is about six years, and then mine will be about five years. So it, it means still definitely a long time. Yes. Um, but, you know, you're going through you know a couple couple of years where you're doing you know your your general work and then you have to pass your qualifying exams and then you start your research on your own dissertation. So um, kind of a long process, um, but it's definitely broken up in the in the manageable chunks. The uh, when I went I went to Ohio State for my doctoral and they said that if you came in with an MA, it would usually take yeah about six years, and if you came in without an MA, you were thinking more like seven to nine years and. I was I got out within five and a half years, but I know some people that were there on the 11, 12 year mark that had no that had no indication they were going to be graduating anytime soon. So it's a very broad range, but yeah, your range sounds about right, somewhere in the five, six, seven year range. That's about normal, I think, yeah. depending on the how much research you have to do for the dissertation. Some people have to take research trips overseas and all that. Yeah. So at Santa Cruz, they they encourage you to finish, um, you know, relatively close to their guidelines, just because they can't guarantee you know funding mm-hmm. past past a certain time. Um, yeah. You're more than you're more than welcome to spend you know eight, nine, ten years, like like you said, but the last couple of years probably won't be funded um, if you take that long. So. Yeah, that's the way it worked there too. Is that they get they guaranteed you four or five years of funding, and then after that, you're on your own. So at this point, uh, what advice do you have for any of your fellow students or any other listeners who are thinking about going on to a PhD program or, or even a master's level program? Do you have any suggestions, things you would do differently, things that, that you thought went well? Do you have any suggestions for anybody that's interested in following your, in your footsteps? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that I can you know, harp on is to not give up. I had a quarter in my undergraduate career where I kind of just, you know, lost care and yeah, you know, I got a few bad grades and it kind of, you know, dropped my GPA really far down, um, you know, more than what I was thinking about graduating with, um, and it kind of uh, made me wonder if it was, you know, if this was the thing for me. Um, and once I got into Southern New Hampshire and and realized, you know, that you know it was still possible, um, I was able to buckle down and you know get really good grades here. Um, so. You know, for people who are thinking, you know, that, that a PhD is only for the people who get you know, straight A's and are involved in, you know, 100 different activities and clubs, um, you know, don't think like like that. There's, there's a lot of different opportunities and there's a lot of different ways 
that you can go about getting into a PhD program. You know, it's not all, it's not just the, the, the top 5% of the class, you know, that goes into PhD programs. So that would probably be my number one thing. Um, is just, you know, to never give up and never think that something's out of, out of reach just because you have a few bad grades or something like that. I think that's good advice. There's a, yeah, a sense out there that PhDs are for the overachievers, yeah, the straight-A students or whatever. But like we said earlier, that PhD application, there's so much that goes into it, including the writing samples, letters of recommendation, transcripts, GRE, that your overall grades in your undergrad or even in an MA program aren't going to weigh as heavily as they might in other contexts because you have so many other moving parts here. Things like you may, you're, if you have a stellar writing sample, then the university is probably going to be willing to overlook any bad grades you got in, in undergrad classes, especially if it's an unrelated course is like a math course or something. They're not going to pay much attention to those anyway. But if you've got amazing a uh, writing sample, you've got glowing recommendations from your former instructors, then yeah, I think it's gonna, that's going to outweigh uh, problem grades and all of that. Exactly. And then, you know, lastly, I would say don't, don't be afraid to reach out, you know, to professors and ask for their advice or help. I had a lot of help from uh, my undergraduate ad advisor and a lot of help from, you know, even, even from my teachers at Southern Hampshire who, who I've yet to meet, you know, face to face, they were still really helpful. Anytime I had a question about, you know, just a class or my future, I asked um, Professor McConnell a lot about, you know, what it's like to be in a PhD program and, and, and apply to a PhD program. Um, so, you know, just getting little tidbits of advice was really helpful for me. And I think it can be, uh, you know, helpful to other students, too, even if you're only, you know, a freshman or sophomore in college. It's, it's still nice to build, you know, that relationship. So uh, just to wrap up here, do you have any favorite history-related item that you can recommend to all of us? What actually got me into the field of immigration, um, so I, I going into my junior year of my undergraduate career, I didn't really have a direction where I wanted to focus on. You know, I, I was really um, intrigued by you know the 1920s, like you know the whole gangster prohibition era. Uh, that was what I was originally going to focus on. Um, and I ended up picking up a, a book called How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Reese. I know oh, yeah. it's not, you know, technically a history book. And it's more of a, you know, a piece of journalism um, more than anything. Um, but it's essentially a collection of primary photos, you know, showing how immigrants lived in, you know, really bad conditions um, in places like New York City and bigger urban areas. Um, and just looking at those pictures, you know, it was really powerful for me. Um, and that was kind of what got me more into, you know, the field of immigration. And once I started looking at the different books and, you know, ab about the immigrant. Yeah, the Jacob Reese book, How the Other Half Lives, that's an amazing book. It's uh, – I I use photos from it in my in, – when, when I was doing lectures for um, – undergrads or whatever, I would, I would put those photos in the PowerPoint slides and just, just basically just show the photos, and that kind of tells the whole story right there. And it's, it's powerful, yes. That's yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've never actually assigned the book to read in undergraduate classes because there wasn't enough really that much time to spend on it, but I would, I've always yeah. thought it would be really interesting to do because I think it's, it's, it's one of those books that people hear about, but very few people actually read, and it is a very valuable uh, piece of work. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email to snhuhistory at gmail.com. I'm Rob Denning. Thanks for listening. <laughs>